Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. So uh, my name is Katie, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network here at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and we've organised this event for you today. Thank you to everyone who's been able to join us tonight, both online and in person. It's no mean feat pulling together an event like this with hybrid facilities and an international speaker, uh, not to mention the hoops of university compliance and liaising with campus security that you'll have seen uh, that we need to jump through to make this happen. So I'm really, really pleased to have you all here. Um, there's no fire drill scheduled. Um, so if that does happen, please calmly leave the building. Um, uh, this building is thankfully one of the few university Edinburgh buildings with a comprehensive all gender toilet facilities. They're all nice individual cubicles where you don't have to hear other people pee. Um, <laughs> so uh, they're just located down the hall. If you leave around to the right from here or around to the back, you can go around that so everybody gets privacy. Um, I want to make sure before we start that I thank my fantastic colleague and friend Gina for her unwavering support in coordinating this event. She's an expert in the same field as TJ, our speaker, um, and has been making an invaluable contribution to the scholarship in this area, as well as tangible actions to address transphobia on our campus. While I want to give very little oxygen to the campaign of hate against trans people in the UK and across the world, I'd be remiss to not condemn the actions of our um, colleagues who are attempting to spread disinformation on our campuses and espouse some of the damaging rhetoric that is designed to dehumanize the lives of trans people. We are confronted as well with a government who is actively trying to remove the rights from trans, the trans community using the same tactics that we saw employed against gay people in the wake of section 28. I've heard from numerous trans colleagues, students and friends about how scared they are today. Those of us who are not trans have a responsibility to listen and find ways of lending our support and resources in whatever way we can. Being here tonight is a signal that you want to learn, and I'm delighted that we have been able to host TJ Billard tonight. They're an assistant professor in the School of Communication at Northwestern University and executive director of the Center, of, sorry, Center of Apply for Applied Transgender Studies in Chicago in the USA. They are the author of Voices for Transgender Equality, Making Change in the Network Public Sphere, and Editor-in-Chief of the Bulletin of Applied Gender Study, Transgender Studies. They will be presenting today for about 50 minutes, um, and then I will hand over to our Q&A Chair, Sophia Woodman, who is one of the co-presidents of UCU Edinburgh, to facilitate audience Q&A. Um, those of you in person will be able to ask questions directly, um, and that will be facilitated, and everybody attending online will have the option to use the Q&A function on the Zoom webinar. So that's enough from me. I will hand over to TJ. Okay, first a microphone check, is it working? Okay, wonderful. Uh, hello everyone, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, first, of course, a thank you uh, to Katie for that very warm introduction and to Katie and Gina both uh, for organizing this event and making it uh, possible. Uh, it's a great honor to be asked to speak at any institution, uh, but an even greater uh, honor to be asked to speak at one as, an histor as historic as this one. Um, I also know that this lecture comes at a very particular time in the history and intellectual culture of this institution and indeed this country, uh, so it's both an honor uh, and of course a responsibility to be here today. Uh, the title of my lecture is Cis-Informed, Disinformation and the Media War on Transgender Rights, uh, which is the working title of my current book project focusing on the central role of misinformation in anti-trans movements political strategies uh, in both the US and the UK, uh, why those strategies work and what can be done to curb misinformation influence on policy and public opinion. And in many ways, this lecture uh, kind of captures in miniature the argument uh, that I build across the book's chapters, offering a kind of summary of the theoretical framework uh, that guides the work. But before I uh, present that framework, uh, I want to turn back the hands of the clock a little bit to trace what brought me to this project. And that serendipitously requires me to talk a little bit about my new book, uh, which is set to be shipped to everyone who pre-ordered it today, uh, also serendipitous. Uh, so my new book, uh, Voices for Transgender Equality, Making Change in the Network Public Sphere, insert, insert like winking self-promotion uh, noise right here, uh, is out October 25th from Oxford University Press. Uh, and it offers an insider's view into transgender activism during the first two years of the Trump administration, during which trans people were thrust into the center stage of uh, uh, US politics. 
uh, drawing on extensive ethnographic fieldwork uh, at the National Center for Transgender Equality in Washington, D.C. Uh, the book shows how transgender rights activists developed a kind of unique blend of online and offline strategies to saturate a diverse ecology uh, of na national news outlets, local and community media outlets, and uh, social networks across the country, uh, both public and private conversations on multiple platforms, all with voices in support of their cause. Moreover, these activists uh, navigated the complex flows of information and ideas among all of these different domains of the very complicated information system we all currently inhabit in order to shape the national conversation on transgender rights. Um, although the book takes a very broad uh, perspective on uh, transgender rights uh, movements, communication strategies in the US, uh, it does not focus on misinformation in any specific way, uh, but my time in the field saw uh, the increasing prominence of misinformation in public debates on transgender rights. So for example, I was there the day that President Donald J. Trump, still sounds weird to say, uh, announced by tweet uh, his intention to ban transgender service members from the US Armed Forces. Uh, regardless of your opinion on military, uh, this decision would have expelled 15,000 transgender people from their jobs, and it was one that attempted to set a legal precedent for employment discrimination against trans people in the federal government. How did he motivate that decision? Uh, well, he motivated it with deliberate misinformation about the costs of providing trans inclusive health care. Uh, I was also there when the Alliance Defending Freedom, a conservative political advocacy organization and recognized hate group in the United States, uh, and a leader of the anti-transgender rights movement, ran a disinformation campaign in the US state of Georgia, um, spreading misinformation uh, in order to overturn a trans-inclusive school policies in the state's uh, public school system, uh, specifically making misinformed claims about kindergartners, uh, because never too young to start hating people. Uh, and I was witnessing all of these things happen at the same time that I was seeing colleagues in trans studies begin to grapple with the rising tides of fascism and what that meant uh, for trans people, uh, particularly uh, uh, around, um, around uh, what we would broadly call transgender rights, uh, even though it was more often uh, transgender like life exclusion. Um, and we also I also was seeing colleagues in the field of communication and allied fields begin to more seriously grapple with the social and the political dynamics of misinformation. Uh, but across both of these areas of scholarly debate, I felt like there was a lot uh, missing in terms of uh, its uh, grasp of the realities of mis and disinformation as they actually exist and as they're actually experienced in daily life. Trans studies for its part offered important historical contextual arguments that illuminated the origins of much anti-trans disinformation, as well as really insightful critical perspectives on how cisgender, I don't need to say it to this audience, but I always put it in, which means non-transgender uh, ideologies constrain transgender possibilities. Variously, trans studies scholars had analyzed the relationship between debates over transgender inclusion in feminism and racist and colonial discourses. They traced long histories of medical gatekeeping and state-sanctioned violence against trans people. They critiqued the influence of Christian nationalist ideology in opposition to transgender rights. And they argued that so-called concern for the welfare of trans youth uh, often shrouded transphobia in a very thin patina of care while actively ignoring or discrediting the legitimate science establishing both the safety and the necessity of transition-related care uh, for many trans youth. At the same time, as illuminating as much of this analysis is and as much as it contributed to my own analytical lenses on the issue of anti-trans disinformation, there was much missing from the trans studies literature. Primarily, most of this research was of a critical theoretical orientation, meaning that it did not engage necessarily empirically with the practical realities of anti-trans mis- and disinformation. In offering this kind of high-level analysis of structuring ideologies, historical contexts, ethical quandaries, and so on, this scholarship avoided some of the more grounded analyses of the problem's causes and consequences or its material impact on daily life. And as a result, the scholarship didn't necessarily identify or, or gesture to what practical solutions might be that could improve the material conditions of transgender life. 
So in short, it became clear to me that what was needed was a more applied trans studies approach, a kind of approach that synthesizes critical perspectives from transgender studies with methodological and theoretical tools from other often medical, legal, and or social scientific areas of study uh, to generate empirical insights that might inform policy, uh, but also kind of uh, industry practice as well, uh, and to affect the policies and practices that determine the life chances of trans people. And this approach to trans studies has since become characterized, uh, or has, sorry, has since become characteristic of my work and uh, of the work of many other trans scholars as represented by the Center for Applied Transgender Studies that I founded, which uh, very proudly boasts nearly 40 of the world's leading trans scholars, including many uh, from here in the UK, uh, and by the Bulletin of Applied Transgender Studies uh, that the center publishes. Now, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here and give the impression that there was no work of this more applied nature. Uh, focusing on anti-trans misinformation, there very much so was. Uh, but much of this work came out of the field of transgender health research. Uh, and it was this body of work that confirmed for me a lot of my anecdotal experience in the field, which is that the most central forms of anti-trans misinformation were specifically health misinformation. And this is a point that's been crucial to my unfolding project. So at the same time, scholars in my home field of communication um, began to direct serious scholarly attention to the issues of misinformation, which had previously been a relatively small area of study. Um, it was a, a, a niche that really was a great investment for the scholars who were there uh, at the time, as it's kind of become one of the defining features of our field. Um, but the topic was really given this kind of motivating fire by um, discourses about fake news, uh, which kind of really became more of a moral panic than anything else, uh, as, as well as things like widespread deterioration uh, in institutional trust and changing norms of journalism in the wake of Donald Trump's candidacy, candidacy and eventual election uh, to the U.S. presidency. And this literature makes important distinctions between two different types of false information with different kind of geneses and motivations. And that first is disinformation, which is defined as false or misleading information that is intentionally spread for profit, to create harm, or to advance political or ideological goals, while misinformation serves as this, as this more kind of general reference to incorrect information that is spread without malicious intent, often but not always, out of ignorance, uh, misplaced trust, or misunderstanding. So the rapidly growing literature on mis and disinformation has documented the various kind of attitudinal and behavioral effects that misinformation exposure can have on individuals. And it evaluates the kind of uh, efficacy of various interventions that are aimed at preventing or counteracting misinformation's effects. The scholarship consistently shows that exposure to misinformation not only leads to the adoption of false factual beliefs, but negatively influences individuals' attitudes towards social outgroups. It increases opposition to beneficial policies and practices. It decreases the likelihood of voting for certain political candidates or parties. It decreases trust in social and political institutions, and it negatively impacts individuals' health behaviors and political behaviors. So basically, it sucks. Uh, this work further documents the variable efficacy of different interventions, including things like boosting factual knowledge and media literacy, inoculating people uh, with correct information in order to kind of strengthen their mental resistance to misinformation when exposed to it, nudging people to critically assess misinformation by redesigning the choice architecture of our media. You maybe, for example, have gone to a uh, retweet or whatever they're calling it now, uh, a post on the platform formerly known as Twitter. And it's been like, hey, do you want to read this article first? That would be considered a kind of nudge design feature. Um, and generally speaking, these interventions are at best moderately effective uh, at preventing or correcting misinformation. Um, and they are less effective when the misinformation in question pertains to politics relative to other topic areas. So it's better at things like vaccinations and you know um i'm trying to even think about what else people spread misinformation about these days uh, there's really anything uh but when it comes to politics like good luck fixing it um and these findings have in turn generated a wealth of policy proposals advancing 
technological solutions to this kind of ostensibly individual level problem. But despite the robustness of this growing body of research on misinformation and the consistent kind of replication of its findings, so in short, it's good science, uh, it is profoundly limited in its application to phenomena like anti-transgender disinformation for several theoretical and methodological reasons. So theoretically, this extant literature on misinformation problematically kind of assumes what we in communication studies call a strong effects model uh, of communication that considers bad information, basically a powerful virus that infects an otherwise healthy communication system and produces what is sometimes called information disorder uh, that characterizes what is currently being called an infodemic. Um, those scare quotes were perhaps a little unnecessary. My vo vocal intonation probably told you what I think about that. But I don't. I think we can all agree we never really had a healthy communication system to begin with. So I'm not sure how much we might blame this on some form of informational virus. And this line of scholarship further portrays misinformed individuals variably as kind of hapless victims duped by technology and sometimes as malevolent peddlers of weaponized untruths, neither of which really kind of captures uh, in a nuanced way the ideological and historical contextual factors that shape uh, kind of why people adopt and spread misinformation. And both of them uh, kind of ignore a lot of the things that the trans studies literature I was talking about earlier makes particularly salient uh, as being central to the diffusion of anti-trans misinformation. And at the same time, uh, with all due love and respect to my colleagues in psychology, as somebody trained as a sociologist, uh, there, this literature is really largely built on psychological theories of information processing that meant to that are meant to illuminate kind of individual media consumers as vulnerable to misinformation and how misinformation effects can kind of be corrected at the expense of these kind of more sociological and collective level systemic uh, factors. Methodologically, the literature is very much characterized by relatively small cross-sectional, often lab-based experiments, uh, which don't really generalize particularly well to the real, very complex environments that people um, experience misinformation in. And even when this research does kind of take ecological approaches to estimating real-world misinformation and their effects, um, the variables that people choose to collect are, again, very psychological, personality traits, things like that. Um, even though, as communication studies has long shown, complex sense making is a fundamentally collective endeavor uh, that needs to be analyzed as such. And as a final point, studies of political misinformation and studies of health misinformation have largely remained siloed from one another, uh, only really overlapping to the extent that they both have a shared interest in the mechanisms by which people are exposed and persuaded by misinformation. But why these kind of two remain separate is kind of hard to say. Uh, it might have something to do with disciplinary divides in the academy, with public health scholars just not talking to politics scholars, or it might have to do with meaningful differences in how people perceive and process these different types of information. But regardless of the reason, this divide struck me as a detriment to our understanding, particularly as the case of anti-trans misinformation made clear to me, as did things like I don't know, a global COVID pandemic, uh, that the divide between health and politics didn't really hold up very well. So I kind of found myself in an intellectual uh, dilemma of how do I relate these to each other uh, in a theoretically cogent way. So uh, this is my answer. <laughs> uh, my argument takes as its foundation a general health and human rights perspective, recognizing the complex interdependencies between the health of populations, and the human rights that are due to all people. Since the late 1980s, when the Global Program on AIDS at the World Health Organization centered human rights in uh, its public health strategy for combating HIV AIDS, health and human rights has emerged as a very expansive area of inquiry united by a number of shared premises. First of that being that health is a human right. Uh, the second being that the deprivation of human rights negatively impacts health. And the third being that human rights and access to health care are deeply entwined with one another as various social, cultural, and political institutions structure access to health care and as health care systems play an important role in determining what rights people end up getting access to. 
And the link between health and human rights is particularly salient for trans people, although it's salient for everyone. As articulated in the 2007 Yogyakarta principles and their 2017 extension, trans people are consistently denied access to the care they need. The denial of that care often leads to barriers to accessing basic human rights, and trans youth are especially deprived because they lack legal and medical autonomy. So if we consider, for example, the push to depathologize uh, transgender identity in the 11th revision, of the sharp inhale, World Health Organization's Manual of International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Disorders, better known as ICD-11, uh, depathologization was achieved by removing gender identity from the chapter on mental disorders and placing it in a new chapter on sexual health. So for this depathologization for the countries that abide it, um, it not only influences what care trans people are provided, but also the rights that they can access. So in Russia, for instance, uh, trans people are categor categorically denied access to driving licenses um, on the grounds that their mental illness renders them unfit to drive. So they do not receive legal documentation to their identity because being trans is a, health, is a mental disorder and mentally ill people cannot operate vehicles. Reclassifying trans identity as a concern related to sexual health as opposed to mental health clears that barrier and makes accessible that very basic human right. Not driving, an ID, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, in the United States, there are countless other ways that access to healthcare determines the rights that people are afforded. For example, many states require multiple psychiatrists to authorize gender marker changes on identification documents, which already presupposes mental health care access, um, and which in turn opens trans people up to harassment and discrimination in contexts where their lived gender identity doesn't match the ones on the documents they're required to present to people. Uh, similarly, in the United Kingdom, years-long waiting lists for access to the dwindling number of NHS uh, gender clinics that impose high barriers on eligibility make it harder for trans people to meet the criteria for acquiring uh, gender recognition certificates. And this state of affairs is, of course, still worse for people of color in both countries who have been historically less likely than their white counterparts to receive the legal and medical resources necessary to access care and care dependent rights on top of, you know, every other uh, racist human rights exclusion that they experience. So in the context of transgender inequality, health and human rights kind of serves as this conceptual bridge point between health and politics, providing a lens that allows us to see how efforts to undermine trans rights are intimately tied to efforts to legally prevent access to transition-related care. So policies that prevent, if not prohibit, trans people from accessing necessary care uh, deprive them of basic rights, and that deprivation of rights in turn diminishes basic quality of life. Moreover, this health and human rights perspective allows us to see how health misinformation mobilized to support anti-trans policies simultaneously and in mutually reinforcing ways is targeting both trans healthcare access and trans human rights. A little bit of mental gymnastics, hopefully, hopefully you stretched. Uh, in this way, anti-transgender misinformation is not merely a public health problem, or as scholars in my field like to think about it, a media literacy problem. It is instead better articulated as a human rights problem. And this turn to a rights-based rights -based approach to health that's represented by the health and human rights perspective also dovetails quite neatly with an emergent rights-based approach to health misinformation, not to health misinformation, to misinformation. Um, as legal experts uh, Deirdre Mulligan and Daniel Griffin influentially argued on the basis of the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, misinformation is best understood as an issue of the right to truth, which is increasingly recognized in human rights law as both an individual and a collective right. So in health-specific contexts, misinformation has been articulated as an issue of the in inalienable right to health, to the extent that misinformation influences the policies, practices, and individual behaviors of people in ways that are detrimental to individual and collective health. And then moreover, as I've argued, that uh, health uh, deprives people of their rights to truth, to health, to non-discrimination, to safety, and so on. Um, and this uh, kind of uh, all ends up with a very complex system in which the, the rights uh, of 
health are entangled in rights to truth. And basically, trans people are like, yeah, you don't get any rights of any kind anywhere ever. So now the health and human rights framework offers a necessary starting point for thinking, uh, for linking health and politics and for making clear how anti-trans misinformation, including and especially health misinformation, are related to efforts to deprive trans people of their rights. However, it does not go so far as to explain why anti-trans misinformation is so prevalent or why it's so effective. And to do that, I draw heavily on the work of the eminent media sociologist, Sandra Balrakic, to construct what I'm referring to as a dependency model of misinformation. But it's first necessary to identify what it is that might drive people to a dependency on misinformation. The concept of pervasive social ambiguity is rooted in the sociological social psychology literature and is distinct from other ambiguity related uh, concepts that are more common in the psychological social psych literature, uh, things like attributional ambiguity, ambiguity aversion, and so on. Um, According to Balrokic, who developed this concept, pervasive social ambiguity refers to individual sense of profound disorientation in the face of confusing or chaotic environments, such as societies in periods of rapid social change. This ambiguity arises when individuals are unable to resolve fundamental questions of meaning, and individuals experience it as an affective and cognitive problem producing stress or tension. Importantly, when ambiguity is experienced as a consequence of rapid social change, it is particularly acute during the period between an individual's psychological unhitching from traditional customs, values, and worldviews, and their adoption of more modern versions. As such, pervasive ambiguity uh, kind of exerts significant influence on individuals' attitudes and opinions as they seek to reconstruct their understanding of the social order and resolve their sense of ambiguity. As political scientist and leading misinformation researcher Adam Berensky noted, misinformation also often arises in times of crisis and uncertainty, times during which there is a general sense of pervasive social ambiguity. So during times of crisis and uncertainty, people experience more pervasive social ambiguity, misinformation is more common, and people turn to the media system and other communication resources available to them for the means to reconstruct their understanding of the social order and resolve that sense of ambiguity, making them more likely to be meaningfully influenced by misinformation. This last corollary about this likelihood of influence comes from Balrakic's media system dependency theory, which uh, is very complicated in graphic form. I'm going to try to break it down. Um, uh, media system dependency theory posits that there exist uh, tripartite dependency relations between individuals, media systems, and social systems. And social systems here are things like the state, uh, but also economic systems, and so on. Um, such that each holds power over the other to the extent that they control the information resources that are necessary for the attainments of the other's goals. Specifically, media system dependency posits that the media system's influence on individuals and on social systems is greater when individuals or social systems are, depend are more dependent on the media system for its resources. And these re relations operate at three levels, the macro, the micro, and the meso. At the macro level are dependencies between media systems and social systems. At the micro are the dependency relations between media systems and individual media users. And at the meso level are the dependency relations between media systems and communities or interpersonal networks. Importantly, media systems function as tools of collective meaning making and they provide a shared basis for understanding the social world. This makes the messages that circulate in the media system centrally important for individuals seeking to understand the world around them and for social systems like the state that must react to the changing conditions of the social world. So as a result, in times that are characterized by per pervasive social ambiguity, individuals, communities, and the state are all more dependent on the media system for messages that give order to the chaos of current social circumstances. When we think about misinformation, we care obviously about all three levels, but we tend to, for, to focus more on the micro and the meso levels because we care about how misinformation affects the attitudes, opinions, beliefs, and behaviors of 
individuals and our communities. Media system dependency theory argues that when individuals experience greater pervasive social ambiguity, they experience greater dependency on the media system for the resources necessary to reconstruct their understanding of the social world. And when somebody has a greater dependency on the media system, the messages that circulate in that media system, and especially those messages that alleviate ambiguity, exert a greater influence on them. But individuals also don't necessarily experience a uniform media system, particularly in the digital age. Rather, individuals construct their own media systems as they work to understand their social environs and themselves. So individuals may experience different effects of the, their media dependencies to the extent that they construct different media systems. Importantly, these dependency relations do not only occur at the individual level, they also occur, occur at the community level. Uh, as a long history of communication scholarship has shown, people do not receive and interpret information alone, but we do it within our social networks. These networks influence what information people are exposed to, how they process that information, and where it concerns ambiguity, individuals turn to media systems alongside their community networks to restore social understanding. And of course, individuals experiencing ambiguity due to media or some problematic feature of the social environment will find it easier to build a consensual definition with their friends if they have common media experiences. So this further fuels the spread of order restoring misinformation among social networks as communities attempt to come to collective resolutions for their shared pervasive ambiguity. Of course, uh, media systems do not only affect individuals and communities, they also affect larger social systems like economic systems and perhaps most crucially for our purposes, the state with which they have relationships of mutual dependency. The media system is quite obviously dependent on the state for informational resources because they require access to government data, updates on governmental actions, analysis from government sources, uh, and all of these things in order to produce news. But the state is also dependent on the media system in several ways. Um, for instance, the state requires the informational resources of the media in order to communicate or sometimes miscommunicate uh, with the mass public. Um, and indeed, research shows, or sorry, additionally, the state is dependent upon the media system in order, uh, how do I want to say this? Uh, the state is dependent on the media system to the extent that the media system presents the construction of the social world that policymakers are responding to. So a, a lot of research uh, has shown that at the state level, the issues represented in the media system are those about which the most policies are proposed. So when the media system circulates messages about challenges to the existing uh, social arrangements, the state makes policies intended to settle or resolve those challenges. The state's dependency on the media system once meant that policymakers were responding to issue agendas that were set by mass media outlets, uh, and in particular by the mass news media. There's a long literature just complaining about the New York Times and the undue influence it has on American Congress people. Uh, but the media system has transformed with the emergence of digital media and the dynamics of dependency have shifted. Policymakers now are increasingly responding con to constructions of social issues as they are constructed in digital and in partisan media, uh, within which misinformation are far more prevalent. Uh, so when the constructions of the social world circulating through the media system are informed by misinformation, the state's dependency on the media system means that policymakers are more likely to make policy addressing social, medical, and political realities that do not exist or have been often intentionally misconstructed. Thus, a dependency model of misinformation helps us better understand how and why misinformation uh, matters both by attending to the individual level effects in a manner that considers people's place in uh, social and cultural structures instead of you know viewing them atomistically from this kind of purely psychological perspective. And it also considers the meso level community and macro level political effects of misinformation as well. So as great as this dependency model of uh, misinformation is, or at least I think so, it's up to you to make up your own mind. Uh, how is it relevant to understanding anti-trans misinformation specifically? Uh, now that I've bored you with theory talk, I'm gonna talk about trans people again. Um, so, uh, so far I've, I've basically argued the following. First, 
that during times of rapid social and cultural change, people experience a sense of pervasive social ambiguity, which in turn increases their dependency on the media system. Second, during such times, myths and disinformation are also proliferate in the media system, and that myths and disinformation offers individuals and communities experiencing pervasive ambiguity resources to alleviate ambiguity. Third, individuals and communities construct different media systems suited to their specific goals, meaning that exposure to myths and disinformation will differ among the population. And finally, to the extent that the state is dependent on the media system, the prevalence of mis- and disinformation in that media system will shape the laws and policies considered and often therefore thereafter enacted by the state. So my current program of research consists basically of a number of studies taking these pieces apart and showing them uh, one by one in both the US and the UK. So drawing on some of that ongoing research, I wanna address these four points in turn. So first, let me address the claim about the relationship uh, between rapid social and cultural change, pervasive ambiguity, and dependency on the media system. In the original context in which Sandra Balrakich uh, developed this theory in the 1970s, uh, individuals, communities, uh, and the state were dependent on the media system's informational resources to adjust to rapid social change, such as racial unrest, urban violence, and war as they came to dominate daily life in the 1970s in the US. In contemporary society, social progress in areas such as transgender rights and racial justice have disrupted longstanding arrangements of gender hierarchy and white supremacy in society, while rapid changes in the technological infrastructure of the media system and declining trust in established institutions of the press has dif have disrupted earlier organizations of knowledge production and informational authority. So in an ongoing nationally representative uh, survey study in the United States that I am uh, conducting with my student uh, Nash Jenkins, uh, we have some preliminary analyses that are informing my argument um, and in that study, we find that individuals increasing dependencies on digital media specifically and their declining trust in legacy institutions of the press are both associated with general increases in their experiences of a broad sense of pervasive social ambiguity. Uh, in short, the more people use digital media as their primary source of information, the more they feel like they have no idea what's going on in the world, even though they are very informed. That ambiguity in turn only reinforces their dependencies on digital media as they serve or as they search for resolution to the ambiguity that digital media itself is contributing to. Basically becomes a vicious cycle of addiction of this thing is damaging my sense of the social world. And it is also the only way I can try to understand the social world. And we find that this is partially explained by respondents' uh, perception uh, that the content of digital media is largely crisis-oriented and represents the perspectives, values, and opinions of people whose ideas they find dangerous to society. In the more specific context of trans topics, rapid increases in the public visibility and acceptance of trans people have had a disorienting effect on society. Society with an asterisk, that asterisk being certain people in society, and many people have experienced a sense of pervasive ambiguity as the otherwise uh, stable categorizations of biologically determined, God-ordained, and socially sanctioned genders have been to some extent or another challenged by the increasing acceptance of trans identity. So in a separate uh, ongoing survey study that I'm conducting with my student Nash, um, uh, we've developed a psychometric scale that measures, uh, see, I don't hate all psychology, um, in measuring people's experiences of pervasive ambiguity uh, relating to gender specifically. And we find early evidence of high levels of pervasive social ambiguity about gender in society, with individuals reporting high levels of belief that norms around gender are changing at a rate and in ways that they cannot follow and that they cannot comprehend. And of course, this sense of ambiguity is not experienced universally. It is experienced more prominently among older adults, those with more traditional gender role beliefs, those who are more right wing, those who are higher in authoritarianism, those who are more religious, and interestingly, those who have a lower sense of gender self-esteem. So the more that people feel uncertain about what their own gender means as they watch social definitions of gender change, they experience a sense, in essence, of panic over I don't know what my own gender means if gender doesn't mean the things I thought it meant. 
Uh, and I think we can all probably think about people we know who we might describe that way. So uh, these people thus find themselves turning to the media system for the resources that are needed to reconstruct their understanding of the social order regarding gender and to resolve their anxieties over the emergence of trans people as a salient category of identity. And given the wide accessibility of misinformation about trans topics in the media system on which individuals experiencing that pervasive ambiguity are dependent, uh, individuals may adopt order restoring beliefs and misinformation that tell them, in essence, that the emergence of trans people is not a state of affairs to which they must adjust and adopt new worldviews, but instead it's a problem for them to oppose to restructure their existing worldviews. This brings me then to my second claim about the proliferation of myths and disinformation uh, that serve as tools for people experiencing pervasive social ambiguity about gender to resolve that ambiguity. So I'm currently conducting uh, a content analysis project together with a team of researchers at Northwestern and also at the University of Washington, uh, Washington State, not the capital, uh, which investigates the prevalence of anti-trans misinformation in both news media and Facebook content across five years from the start of 2018 to the end of 2022. Uh, while the data set is huge and our analysis is still ongoing, and by huge, I mean like hundreds of thousands uh, of data points for analysis, um, some key trends have started to emerge from our analysis, allowing us to identify several important categories of mis- and disinformation about trans people, uh, most of which focus on trans youth, all of which uh, focus on trans health, uh, and all of which also offer people who are experiencing this pervasive sense of social ambiguity order restoring beliefs by telling them, again, as I said, that trans people are not a state of affairs to get used to, but actually are kind of a conspiracy to be resisted. And so these dominant types of misinformation include uh, definitional misinformation, which is misinformation about uh, what transition-related care is and what it does. For example, uh, there are common claims that we find in our data set that prepubescent children are being given harmful cross-sex hormones to induce uh, the puberty opposite uh, to the sex uh, that is associated with the opposite sex to that which they were assigned at birth. When in actuality, as many of you in this room will know, I'm a little bit preaching to the choir here today, but uh, I mean, I'd much rather that than the alternative. Uh, so, um, uh, actually, uh, peripubescent children are being provided with safe and reversible puberty blockers that delay the onset of puberty that the body would naturally induce until an age at which they are old enough to decide to either come off puberty blockers or undergo uh, hormone replacement therapy, or HRT. And in the United States, currently that age is 16. I'm not certain what it is here in the UK. Um, second, we have misinformation about the accessibility of trans care, such as claims that trans youth who express inconsistencies in gender presentation are being pressured by medical providers to undergo medical transition, when in actuality, uh, there are quite a limited number of providers uh, from whom youth can receive gender affirming care, an increasingly small number, uh, which they generally must do uh, in the US with dual parental consent. Uh, after psychiatric assessment and a period of social transition, and of course, it's America, so with approval from health insurance providers who decide whether or not they want to pay. Third, we have misinformation about the safety of trans care, such as claims that transition-related care, and in particular, HRT is experimental in nature and likely harmful to the body, when actually HRT, among other kinds of transition-related care, is medically safe, and most importantly, because uh, they are who we care about, it consists of treatments routinely provided to cisgender people. Uh, fourth, we have misinformation about the cost of transition-related care. This is one that uh, is a distinctly American uh, uh, piece of misinformation that we saw in our data set because, you know, the idea that people should have health care uh, is a, a little bit more of a debate over there. Um, so these include claims that providing transition related care uh, place financial burdens on public services like Medicare and military provided insurance and drive up private insurance rates. Uh, though actually, in case you were curious, uh, the cost to provide all members transition-related care uh, who have health insurance equates to 22 cents per month per member. Uh, and that is for, sorry, that's for military-provided insurance. For private insurance in the U.S., it's between uh, 1.6 cents and 6 cents per member per month. 
There's misinformation uh, about desistance or the frequency with which people cease to be trans or detransition, such as claims that over half of all youth uh, who identify as trans will grow out of it by adulthood, when actually as few as two and a half percent of youth who identify as trans in childhood, which includes, by the way, those who never received transition related care to begin with, just who claim that identity to a doctor, uh, will go on to later identify as cis, among many, many other types of misinformation. So regarding my third claim that different individuals and communities will be exposed uh, to different kinds and amounts of misinformation and disinformation based on the media systems they construct, our content analysis project has made evident the very wide range of sources in which misinformational claims about trans people are made in both the US and the UK. While certain outlets that we might expect carried certain uh, carried significant amounts of misinformation of various types, uh, most notably the US and the UK outlets owned by uh, one Mr. Murdoch, uh, many respected outlets like the New York Times and the, the Guardian uh, carried similar amounts, albeit we did notice distinctions in how they were couched prose-wise. Um, we also discovered the wide breadth of niche Facebook groups and pages peddling anti-trans misinformation. Uh, to communities of various sizes and types. And this ranged from evangelical preachers who were making video sermons for their local parishioners to alt-right uh, social media celebrities who were posting rage bait content for audiences of primarily uh, angry teen boys. Um, and that's not a joke, I'm genuinely, that's who uh, a lot of these um, videos were meant for. Uh, given the largely digital distribution and consumption of much of this content, we also might expect, uh, though we cannot currently measure, we're working on that, um, algorithmic filtration plays an important role in determining how much and what kinds of mis disinformation uh, individuals are exposed to, uh, particularly likely that there's an, in an increase in the amount of mis and disinformation uh, that people see uh, the more they engage in that content, basically entering a vicious cycle that they actually kind of can't escape uh, being exposed to it once they've engaged with it. Finally, I need to address the final claim that the prevalence of mis and disinformation in the media system shapes the laws and policies of the state. In the United States, <laughs> we can see this happen quite clearly. Uh, such as with the false claim that hormone blockers cause irreversible damage uh, to developing bodies where policymakers pursue policies pertaining to trans youth that restrict their access to uh, healthcare. One of the more prominent instances of this was the Save Adolescents from Experimentation or SAFE Act that was signed into law in Congress, uh, signed into law in Arkansas in 2021, which was motivated by misinformation, which it cited news articles uh, that had published these false claims uh, in their defense um, about the safety and the costs for trans of care for trans youth. Uh, the SAFE law bans the provisions of transition-related care for trans people under 18. It prohibits doctors from referring patients to other providers for such treatments. And it prohibits insurance from covering transition-related care at all for anyone, child or not, despite the fact that the law is motivated as a defense of children. It also, in a manner akin to reproductive rights laws in states that are banning abortion right now, um, also makes it illegal to go to another state to get that care if you are a resident of its state, although that will likely not stand before the courts because uh, of federation system. In 2023, as of today, uh, legislation targeting trans people has been introduced in 49 of the 50 states, passed in 23, so just under half, uh, with a further 35 bills that have been introduced federally in Congress. On July 27th of this year, we also saw the Republican-controlled U.S. House Committee of the Judiciary, uh, which is the most prestigious committee of Congress, uh, hold a hearing on the dangers and due process violations of gender-affirming care. Those are their words. Uh, which claimed to, again, using their words, examine and expose how children are being coerced by adults in positions of authority into life-altering and medically questionable gender transition procedures without full understanding of the meaning or impact, unquote. The two and a half hour long hearing, which I watched all of, pray for me, um, featured testimony from four anti-trans campaigners 
and one pro-trans, uh, who uh, appear frequently in news media. These include a representative from the Southern Poverty Law Center designated hate group, the Family Research Council, uh, that peddled known misinformation about the nature and process of transition-related care along just more general demonizing myths about trans people. And of course, in the UK, you have all seen how the misinformation driven media circus around trans youth care in particular has resulted in efforts to close the Tavistock Clinic uh, and various forms of misinformation around sports, sexual violence and hospital wards, and even clothing changes at swimming spots uh, have mobilized opposition to the Gender Recognition Act and the Gender Recognition Reform in Scotland, even leading the UK Parliament, as we all know, to uh, impinge upon Scottish sovereignty, all in the name of hating trans people. Now, uh, much of this misinformation enters public discourse via what we might consider mainstream media sources, which are invested with various forms of social, cultural, political, and economic power. But misinformational claims such as those I previously mentioned uh, appear frequently uh, in articles and op-eds in the New York Times and in The Guardian uh, with a consistent stable of misinformation peddling authors that include, among others, Jesse Single and Abigail Schreier. But they also appear in primetime segments on news programs like 60 Minutes in the United States and Newsnight here in the UK in best-selling popular press books like Schreier's Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. So dramatic. I mean, think, think about what that linguistic talent could be put to uh, in, another, in another topic. Uh, and Helen Joyce's ironically named trans when ideology and reality meet. Uh, and on some of the world's most popular podcasts, whether or not they should be popular, like the Joe Rogan Experience, which audio streaming service Spotify paid approximately $200 million for an exclusive licensing deal. They also find purchase online, where they are spread by figures with large online followings, like Chaya Raichik, known by the username Libs of TikTok, for those of you who spend too much time on Twitter, Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh. And perhaps most surprisingly to us, not anymore, but at the time, author J.K. Rowling and technology investor, I won't call him an inventor because he's not, Elon Musk. And they do so through public Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages, among others. So uh, it's interesting, too, that in my team's ongoing content analysis research, we found that far-right political actors, as well as ostensibly left feminist ones like the Alliance Defending Freedom, Christian Concern, uh, Concerned Women for America, Fair Play for Women, LGB Alliance, and PragerU, among others, paid to run advertisements containing significant transgender health misinformation on meta-owned platforms like Facebook and Instagram. Not threads, though. No one uses threads. They keep trying to convince that we're going to. We're not. And these advertisements, which Meta classifies as sponsored posts relating to social issues, elections, or politics represent fundamentally well-resourced efforts to ensure the wider spread of transgender health misinformation with the clear and express intention of justifying anti-transgender policies. And to a great extent, disinformation operates, as I argue, as a political strategy for anti-trans campaigners. The disinformation they spread increases the sense of pervasive social ambiguity that people experience by constructing trans people and their rights as sources of social deterioration and as threats to cis people's safety and even their own identities, such as in gender critical claims that trans people are trying to erase women. At the same time, this disinformation offers a salve to the same ambiguity that it's creating, right? The salve is to reject gender ideology and to ensure laws, policies, and even basic social practices like how you label restrooms in your cafe are inhospitable to trans people. And their disinformation-driven political strategy seems to be working when we look at the current state of trans rights in both countries. Something else that stands out as particularly surprising is the unlikely alignment between Anglo-American feminists, in scare quotes, and the US Christian right in both ideology and strategy, with collaborations across this transatlantic movement against transgender rights made up of people whose politics are ostensibly incompatible. In one particularly unexpected incident, unexpected to me, I don't know what you expected, but Posey Parker and Julia Long flew from the UK uh, to Washington, DC, where they did two things. One, 
They heckled Sarah McBride, a trans woman and the national press secretary for the human rights campaign, who had just participated in a meeting between the parents of trans youth and uh, Congress people. And then second, met with the Heritage Foundation, which is a Christian right political advocacy organization active in things like climate change denial, restricting reproductive rights, anti-LGBTQ rights advocacy, and even claiming that the Black Lives Matter movement is a Marxist revolution meant to destroy America. So this picture isn't of uh, Posey Parker and Julia Long's visit. This is a separate set of US and UK self-identified feminists who chose to speak on a stage at the Heritage Foundation because it wasn't just the ones. All of this leaves us with a final question, uh, now that I'm already five minutes over time, which is, <laughs> what do we do about it? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is not simple, uh, or if it is simple, it has eluded me. Uh, by, uh, but drawing on my dependency model of misinformation and my analysis of anti-transgender misinformation in both the US and UK, I see four major points in uh, urgent need of attention. First, we need to work to decrease the amounts of mis- and disinformation about trans people within the media system on which individuals, communities, and the state have dependencies. Duh. Um, that will necessarily entail disempowering actors who serve as strategic disinformers. There will also need to be coordinated efforts by social media platforms to identify and quarantine known instances of misinformation much less likely now that Musk owns one of those platforms, but also by news producers who need to alter the practices that put known misinformation into print, among other changes. Because we know uh, from our data that while a lot of the misinformation is coming from uh, more fringe sources, in fact, the vast majority of what people are exposed to is still misinformation that is carried, sometimes just as perspective uh, in uh, the legacy press. Second, we need structural rather than individual psychological interventions to decrease individuals and communities' dependencies on mis- and disinformation by helping them resolve their pervasive social ambiguity that drives many of them to believe in, if not seek out, that misinformation. We need to find alternate routes to addressing that uh, sympathetic, if not excusable, experience in order to ensure that the mis- and disinformation are not effective tools uh, at, at swaying their politics. Third, we need to root our change-making efforts in community-level communication systems where collective sense-making processes best unfold. It's through meaningful ties to our community and collective conversations about the issues that affect us that we move through complex changes, not without conflict, but perhaps without the kinds of ambiguity and perceptions of threat that end up leading to hate and violence. Uh, as I saw in the fieldwork that I conducted for my book, uh, Insert Winking Sound Again, Voices for Transgender Equality, Making Change in the Network Public Sphere, transgender advocates often were most effective when they focused on their own local communities, not dealing with media per se, um, rooting their stories and experiences in the collective life of the community and grounding the realities of transgender life in the community rather than having fights over trans rights stay abstract, remote, and national. This is a bit more of a kind of urgent concern in the US where it's an entire continent worth of country. And so it's very easy for many parts of the country to like, trans rights are things that happen out there and not at home. And so rooting our conversations about trans rights at that local community level does a lot to change what that conversation looks like. And finally, we must bolster the state against mis- and disinformation. Uh, the path forward on this point is perhaps the least clear, uh, given the challenges to holding government to account and to ensuring equity and justice within representative democracies, which are crumbling before our very eyes. But it is clear that anti-trans mis- and disinformation are a major problem in need of addressing because they are at a basic level diminishing quality of life for trans people in immeasurable ways and reducing the life chances um, uh, presented to trans youth in particular. I hope that my research as it unfolds might identify a, a few more concrete steps uh, addressing the problems of mis- and disinformation. And I know that much of the uh, brilliant work being undertaken by other scholars uh, will help in this endeavor. And in fact, another shameless plug, the Bulletin of Applied Transgender Studies, of which I am the editor-in-chief, is currently accepting abstracts for a special issue of the journal that is focusing on online uh, transphobia and disinformation. So I look forward to all of the wonderful work that will come out of that 
uh, and hopefully lead us to a brighter future for trans people. Also, please submit if you're working on this. Um, thank you all so much for your time. I look forward to the discussion. Okay. All right. That was that was wonderful, TJ. Really appreciate it. Thank I'm you. Sophia Woodman. Um, yeah, pronouns she, her, and um, co-president of the UCU branch committee, which stands in solidarity with our trans colleagues and students, um, and has tried to show that solidarity this week. Um, to some pushback, I might say. <laughs> so we are dealing at, at this uh, at this level also with trying to educate our community, TJ. And so welcome your kind of that uh, input. And and I wanted to say, as somebody who a cisgender woman of a certain age, I needed to um, have my own education in this area. Right? I I I you know, you, you, I could see the trajectory of that narrative developing over time, which we've seen played out today. Um, and, and it's easy to get drawn in if you don't, if you're not informed, right? It is about providing information and countering these narratives in a really detailed kind of way. So um, I, I, I'm, I want to save most of the time for the audience questions, but I guess I wanted to kind of throw a big um, question at mm -hmm. you to start with. Um, uh, hey, capitalism, yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just that. Yeah, so, so I guess, um, you know, what, what we see in this country is very much, uh, um, you know, social uh, ambiguity being generated by political yeah. actors to avoid the consequences of years of austerity and um, neglect of yeah. the public sphere. And we can think about trans people as one, um, one targeted group, but there yeah. are also others. And there's all kinds of we, we saw at the Tory party conference, a whole stream of disinformation. So I wonder if you'd like to say anything about that. And I do have one more question before yeah. we move to the audience. There's so many ways to talk about capitalism <laughs> as it relates to disinformation. One of them is how simply profitable it is uh, to engage as a kind of disinforming actor uh, in the digital public sphere in, in quite a number of ways. It's profitable for media outlets who are are click dependent. Uh, the fact is outrage, uh, strong affect, typically strong negative affect, uh, controversial social issues all equal clicks. And when trans people are the menu item of the day uh, on the outrage machine, that leads to greater economic profit for media actors themselves. It is also immensely profitable for individuals who make a career as what we could kind of coarsely call political influencers, but that seems to be giving them a little bit too much credit. Um, they're more um, they're more kind of self-appointed pundits in many ways that use platforms like Twitch, YouTube. Uh, TikTok is a little bit less of a kind of clear profit model for them. Uh, and they simply make a lot of money doing it. And there are lots of them who saw how much more attention and outrage that they could generate by talking about trans people than about some of the issues they previously talked about. And so trans people became an increasingly common feature of what they talked about, right? And like Matt Walsh didn't just make a film because he hates trans people. He made a film to make money. <laughs> uh, and so uh, obviously that is particularly uh salient um there's one other major point about capitalism i was going to make uh not an exhaustive list of my comments about capitalism but uh ones that were particularly salient um my i yeah. prompt the media system itself i mean there's those influences but the the way that that sort of um that symbiotic relationship and we see that particularly in the uk with the dominance of right, right wing media in this field. Yes. So that is one of the things that too is the is what the changing economics of the media system look like. Um, 
in, in a variety of ways, in, in terms of ownership, particularly in the US, deregulation of media industries that have, uh, have dramatically transformed uh, certain things around uh, the ownership of partisan media and other things like that. Uh, and um, there's a great extent to which um, the kind of like niche focus of a lot of kind of social outrage um, is also kind of related to that dependency, right? Dependency here is meant to be a kind of value neutral kind of exchange of informational resource perspective and dependency involves power relations that are never uh, never one-sided, but also very rarely symmetrical. Um, but dependency also kind of has that secondary connotation, uh, like I am dependent upon something. Like dependency is something that economic actors love to have because greater dependency means greater purchasing, right? Uh, greater uh, economic uh, benefit for the people who are doing the providing of the information on which others are dependent. And so the in the kind of creation of a particular constructed narrative that one must repeatedly follow also ensures a certain degree of return uh, and return in a system in which particularly news actors uh, have seen a decline of basically every other form of income. They primarily paid for their existences off of, yes, advertisements, mostly classified ads, actually, that was the biggest contribution economically, historically, uh, to newspapers and all these other streams of revenue that were making people money that aren't anymore. And so there is a kind of uh, kind of desperate clamor to ensure continued audiences. In the US, it's not worked quite as well because um, I don't know, I don't know how to say this uncoarsely, but basically like nobody reads newspapers. <laughs> like I teach in a school of communication. I teach students who work in and want to work in media and they do not consume news media. Uh, the situation is very different economically for the news media in the UK, uh, uh, both in terms of the fact that there's public funded news media, but also like the private news media is more profitable uh, than the American one is. So in the, in the UK, I do think we have seen how that kind of outrage over trans people has become a little bit more central to the daily churn of news media than the US, where it's a little bit more event driven uh, than it is uh, here. So I wanted to ask you also, and this is kind of unfair okay. a, a question, My favorite but, kind of question. Um, you because you study the US and the UK and Anglosphere, mm -hmm. but it's interesting to reflect from what's called Turf Island mm -hmm. <laughs> by some. Um, what so how does this function elsewhere? Do mm. we know? Are there scholars who are looking at um um because it could it, it seems to me really interesting to compare yes. places where um, this sort of weaponization of trans people's rights and concerns ha have been um, have have not become, you know, uh, subject to widespread disinformation. I mean, yeah. we do know that some of that spreads to other places through all these complex social yeah. media ecologies but i wonder if you know anything about that i know a little um it, there's it's things are widely varied uh, and throughout europe it's kind of hard to trace a clear line uh, it very much is dependent country by country i know for example um in spain the the kind of construction of the kind of the trans debate has very much largely centered on children, but is not centered on children as such. It's focused on the parents of trans children. And it's been less about misinformation and more debates over like, is this socially acceptable? More so couched in what was that kind of like the traditional LGBTQ model in, in other countries of like more, it's like a morality debate as opposed to something that is more uh, information centered uh, or disinformation specifically. There are other countries where it's simply less relevant, but where issues around pervasive social ambiguity are more heightened. So the context I'm most familiar with outside of the Anglosphere are, are Germany and Austria, because I grew up in Austria. And um, there, there is a heightened degree of pervasive social ambiguity around trans identity, because discussing trans identity in German as a, as a language particularly requires a lot of reorientation of the structure of how language functions. Uh, you, journalists are reticent to 
talk about trans people in trans terms because they are reticent to be the wave making around language. Language is also governed uh, in uh, Germany in particular. Like there are literally just like government agencies that like have a uh, very important defining role, as is true in French and, and other languages, not just uh, German. And so things are very different there. Zoom across the world to India, where there's a per very different context where trans people are still not treated well. Let's not get that twisted. But um, where Hindu nationalists have in many ways attempted to capitalize on hijra identities, among other categories uh, of gender variant identities, uh, in order to uh, kind of position uh, India as victims to uh, colonialism and as a culture that's been deteriorated by the West. Um, and that's kind of been one of like Modi's hallmarks is the, this weird articulation of Hindu nationalism via like more decolonial perspectives. And so the position of trans people there, uh, what we would call trans, uh, uh, often it not quite right, uh, but I'm, I'm being coarse here with language. Uh, there's a very different kind of position of how trans people are being talked about vis-a-vis -vis politics. Um, and it also relates to differences in caste system when we think about like where hijra fall uh, uh, in terms of uh, the caste system uh, in many parts of India. So very different system. Then to talk about lots of, uh, of kind of Southern Africa, where a lot of the kind of debates on trans people in politics are actually very specifically rooted to US politics, uh, not just because of cultural imperialism, but because American uh, groups that are fighting trans rights in the United States are also major missionary organizations in Southern Africa who are also funding legislation in those countries, not just uh, to attack trans people, but also uh, to attack LGBTQ plus people more broadly uh, and putting a lot of money behind that and uh, unfortunately succeeding. And it's become a point of activism around companies like Chick-fil-A in the United States because they fund organizations that are funding these legislative battles in Southern Africa. So uh, that's like a short, very rough shot tour of what I have to say about uh, outside the Anglosphere. Mm, that was great. Thank you. All right. So those were the things I was curious about and um, welcome questions from the audience. There's somebody here in the front. I'm just going to test that this is working. Sorry. Hi, hi. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm a trans student from China. Um, I, I, I can, I guess, brief, briefly add on a bit to, to the angle of sphere, but and now I have another point of myself to make. Um, so um, in, in China, I think, especially among uh, feminist circles, uh, in both China and Japan, there's a, a, a large amount of the mis disinformation are imported from the angle sphere, because obviously everyone learns English at school. Um, it's, it's the, the other language people speak. It's the, the language they access the world with. Anyway, um, there's a huge import of especially UK um, transphobic tropes. Um, there was a idolization of J.K. Rowling because in, 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 the, in the olden days, J.K. Rowling used to be this feminist model, right? And that, 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 that sort of stayed on in, I would say, in the entire East Asia. Mm. And um, people did not know, you know, the, the the stuff that happened later that deprived her of that that role. Um, but yeah, uh, there was that. Um, and then um, I guess my own point coming from a, a perspective of a trans person in China, um, I feel like um, so this is also a, 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 a point that. Um, a, a kind of point of difference between cis allies mm -hmm. in China and perspective from trans people themselves in China. So cis allies would oftentimes see these uh, discourses in the feminist circle and point to the misinformation or that. And um, that's very important. But from the trans perspective, I would say, um, so one thing from the slide that, that really uh, struck me was the cover for the At Atlantic, mm -hmm. which... Uh, I quote, uh, well, from my notes, it's you, your child, um, yeah, yeah. Your child says she's trans. She wants hormones and surgery. 
She's the tank. It's also a story about a trans boy, as you might imagine, not a trans girl. It's like this language is just eerily familiar. It's mm -hmm. I think it is the number one struggle of all trans people in China. Um, is basically everyone uh, is afraid of their parents just randomly deciding to send them to a behavioral correction um, institution. Yeah. Uh, we would call it conversion therapy there, but in China, really, it's not really specifically LGBT conversion therapy. It, it's really like a place for like, uh, it, it, initially it's called in, Internet Addiction School. Uh, addiction, like, yeah, it's for, uh, it How started telling. in a psychiatric <laughs> Uh, psych in a in a public psychiatric uh hospital uh in uh Lin Yi Yang Yongxing people know um it started as that but later on it became something where any kind of disobedience any kind of thing that the parents find you know difficult to solve uh I mean being trans is just like being addicted to internet it's just like uh taking drugs it's just like you know all, all, all that stuff um. So I would think, um, so I think, I think a lot of, of, of um, like, I, th I think there's element of I, what I would call the parental ideology, yeah. the idea that parents yeah. have and ought to have an absolute control over the bodies of their children. Yeah. And not just, not just, not just like, uh, minors as well. It's including like, ch uh, uh, people Adult that children. are adults, yeah. Yeah. like people age 22, 24, older, could also be sent to these places. It's because, like, there's widespread, like, acceptance in society of the idea that parents have this absolute power. That parental control over their children's body supersedes, absolutely supersedes the autonomy of young people themselves. Yeah. And I think that is a very core cool element of, uh, of, of the, uh, the power dynamics here that is very little talked about. There's one thing happened in Toronto, uh, Canada. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a huge anti-trans march there with a larger pro-trans crowd. But within the anti-trans, um, I have friends in Toronto, and um, there was this uh, this photo that, that spreads widely on Twitter. There was a young person holding up a card that says, my body belongs to my parents. Like, imagine a person just making a statement that my body does not belong to myself, but it's like... Yeah, I think I think it really shows a lot. Show it's, I mean, I would imagine this person is like forced to do that by her parents, but it shows that the important thing to their parents is maintaining the control yeah. of their children's body. That is why they're afraid of like transgender. Like, it's not like it's not it's not necessarily specifically towards trans people. It's just that they exhibit a kind of bodily deviance that is very embodied and they cannot control. And I think. Uh, yeah, I think we really, really need to look a lot into that. And the, it's, I mentioned this in the speech I, I gave at the protest outside the book launch event as well, um, that I'm very afraid of the same thing happening in the West. Um, because what me uh, one of my friends went on to rescue, uh, well, what happens is state power backs parental power. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm afraid of the same thing happening here because yeah. the rhetoric you see is the same, that rhetoric. She wants hormones and surgery. She's the thing. Yeah. Like that rhetoric is, is exactly the rhetoric that, that is calling for state backing, for absolute parental control, for um, taking away bodily autonomy of young people. Yeah. No, I mean, I can't speak to the UK context uh, culturally uh, or legally in this regard. I can speak a bit more to the US context. And I have fragments of notes about this scattered different places and haven't worked it into this project because I don't know how it like fits puzzle wise. Um, but I think that you're absolutely right. And in the United States, in fact, there have been a number of bills introduced, not just about uh, trans specific things, though it relates to that, for example, forcing teachers to tell parents uh, when children have asked to be called a different name or different pronouns in school. But it also relates just more broadly uh, LGBTQ plus identities. Uh, but there are these parents' rights bills that are being proposed in conservative states, even that like, kind of ideological construction of parental rights. Um, but I think that in a U.S. context, particularly with uh, its kind of histories of puritanical Christianity, uh, kind of fetishization of the kind of nuclear family unit and all of these things, we definitely see a, a, a kind of ideological belief about children's role in society. And that I think extends far beyond trans identity, uh, but is salient here. 
uh, that basically views like children are not people. Children are the potentiality of people in the future, but they do not currently have people. They cannot have self-knowledge because they are not people and people don't have self-knowledge. Uh, they can't have desire. They can't have any of these things. And we see that per uh, particularly in a lot of the puritanical ways that other things are talked about, uh, sexual autonomy, um, all kinds of things. And I think that in American culture, it is very salient in in um, overlapping but different ways than it is in other cultural contexts where children do have a greater degree of uh, autonomy than they do in the US. Um, but there is very much this idea of parental ownership of children. And it, again, that parents have decision rights, not just because it is a legal or divine right that a parent is given, but also because children are incapable of knowing who they are or of wanting things or of having given things for thought or or anything else. Um, and so I, I take your point very well. And I, I do think that it fits in this. I didn't talk about it because I don't know how to make it all work together. Uh, I feel like there's so many kind of converging ideologies that all are just like the perfect storm of trans people don't get <laughs> don't get human dignity uh, and it's coming in so many different directions it's, it's hard to piece them all together kind of mm. uh coherently sometimes mm, thank you okay Can I um ask a question that's online course. oh yeah and we'll come back to the room so um this is i guess somewhat related because it's related to people's ability to learn and come to terms with their gender someone online has asked about how do you feel misinformation has played a role in the education system and young people's ability to learn come to terms with their gender and, so and social skills Mis such as misinformation's effects on cyberbullying trans youth in schools so that's a wonderful question that i don't have a good answer to mm -hmm. um i haven't thought about schools since i left them so i don't study schools uh I don't know much about uh, bullying uh, in schools or, or any of that literature. I mean, I know plenty about bullying in schools, but <laughs> but nothing current. So um, I don't know that I have a good answer to that. Um, I also uh, don't know um, the extent to which misinformation is affecting teachers. I know that in an American context, it is affecting legislation that governs what teachers can and can't do. And so it's having effects in the classroom in that way. I do also know that there is an academic literature uh, that is focused broadly on the LGBTQ youth, but not on trans youth specifically, that has uh, shown uh, with kind of causal inference models that when a state uh, considers uh, anti-LGBTU legislation, and when courts make anti-LGBTQ rulings or are considering them, uh, the bullying the LGBTQ youth in schools experience increases. So I can kind of extrapolate what that effect might be, and I think it might be exactly what you would expect it to be. Um, there was another part of that question that I um, The first part was more about how it's affecting young people's ability to understand their gender. Oh, absolutely, yes. So uh, it's affecting young people in, in a variety of ways. For one, I mean, anytime you kind of are immersed in an ideology uh, or in a system of ideological messages that uh, hinge on your value as a person, like it's impossible to not have that affect you, but it also does affect what people's information seeking processes look like. So if you go to Google, uh, and type, and I, so I actually did this the inverse. I did it as a parent uh, to see what they would, so if you went into Google and said, my kid is trans, what is going to come up? And what are, how, where are you going to be led? You're first gonna have that already moment of panic before you've taken to the internet. You're then going to take to the internet. You're going to look for that information. Mum's net's gonna show up far faster than you think it should uh, among many other places. And I'm sure that information seeking process is not significantly different for youth. Although, as I say, I haven't, I haven't done that specific Google. Um, but as, as much as there are um, models of possibility that are provided for trans youth by virtue of digital media, there are YouTubers, there are TikTokers. You're also then going in and watching them post content and then watching the entire world converge on them to hate them, right? Like Dylan Mulvaney is the overused but also over-relevant example of this in the sphere of TikTok, where as much as she is a um, unrelatably chipper uh, kind of representation of uh, a trans person, of trans possibility, of transition possibility, if you open her comments, 
you want to like retreat from public life on her behalf. So that is, it's not possible that that doesn't affect the calculus that a trans person goes through as to whether or not they want to uh, disclose, whether they not, not they want to acknowledge that identity in themselves, whether or not they want to pursue uh, whatever uh, transition might look like for them. And so I think, you know, when we're talking about an informational and political environment, that is rife and shaped by misinformation, it is a it is oriented to and succeeding at making trans life, if not unlivable, at least unappealing enough that they hope trans people will just decide, nah, I'd rather not. And um, I think to a, a great extent, um, that's kind of been the playbook for, for every type of socially undesirable identity that people would have. Um, uh, and and so I think, you know, trans people aren't unique in that regard, but are the primary target in this uh, particular moment um, from conservative actors. Question at the back there. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm still formulating this in my head, so okay. I apologize if it doesn't make much sense, but... I was quite struck by one of your opening slides showed the different definitions of misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, throughout your talk, it was often mis slash disinformation, mm -hmm. sometimes you use them interchangeably. And, uh, and often a lot of what we're discussing here has relevance to both. But I was curious because, for example, uh, an elderly relative who has 80 years of traditional gender views is very different to a journalist writing deliberate disinformation right. because it's profitable. So I wondered to what extent your theoretical frameworks apply equally to right. both and how we deal with them both together or separately. Yes. So where they so um, I don't know if I succeeded at this. What I was attempting to do. Uh, in my kind of use of language here, was I referred to mis and disinformation together when I talk when talking about the effects, and I was talking about disinformation when talking about the agents because um, mis and disinformation at their experience. If I'm exposed to misinformation or disinformation, it, it's all the same to me. I am receiving incorrect information. The the agency is what kind of defines the miss or dis. So where it's important to delineate disinformation, what differs theoretically is about that circulation and the agent who's responsible, right? The disinformation part is this part that I'm getting at the end about our kind of cadre of actors who are treating disinformation as a form of political strategy to achieve a particular uh, kind of legislative as well as cultural end. And that is where disinformation must be disentangled from misinformation, which, as you say, if an elderly relative sees something on Facebook, panics, hits the share, but we're not thinking about that in terms of disinformation, and it's analytically unuseful to think of it as such. But if we're focusing on the information that is being received and processed by a person that's experiencing a sense of pervasive ambiguity about gender, it doesn't matter if it's mis or dis, it's affecting them presumably or not, perhaps if, if there's some intervening uh, issue, um, the same. And so as it result, as it kind of relates to the end user, quote unquote, there's not necessarily an analytic distinction that I find currently necessary. Okay, great. So over here. Thank you very much indeed, TJ. Brilliant. And thanks to the Thank Pride, Staff Pride Network for arranging this event. I just wanted to ask um, uh, about the question of uh, con um, combating disinformation through community engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think taking on the, the media can just be too much for most people to think about. But is it right that if you actually get the opportunity to go out and speak to a group of people, and they actually get to meet a trans person like myself, possibly for the first time, that could actually make a difference. Just quickly, an example springs to mind. Um, I'm a member of the Unite Scotland LGBT Plus Committee, and my husband's retired Unite branch invited a speaker from the committee, and unfortunately for them, they got me. I basically <laughs> just asked them to cross-examine me, and I wasn't necessarily going to focus particularly on uh, trans and non-binary issues, but I did say I was a trans man. And uh, um, uh, a woman member of the branch basically brought up the very issue that you raised. What if an eight-year-old 
tells the parents that they're trans, aren't they immediately going to go on, on, on hormones and dot, dot, dot. All I did was point out that the waiting list in Scotland, I believe, is still almost four years for a first appointment with the Gender Identity Clinic. That puberty blockers were totally reversible, had been used successfully in the Netherlands since the 1960s, and basically as well, even if that young person aged eight finally got an appointment with the GIC at the age of nearly 12, if the GIC agreed that there was a suitable case for getting puberty blockers, it would still be gate kept by their GP. And it's totally up to the family doctor if they agree that that young person can get them or not. So effectively, far from an eight-year-old suddenly getting, you know, goodness is what all in terms of hormones, the chances are they're going to be possibly 12, about 12 years old, which is probably, well, puberty anyway, um, if they ever get them at all. And I'm glad to say that the lady seemed to think what I said made sense. I hope mm -hmm. it makes sense to everybody here. <laughs> and I just felt that was really good because it was an opportunity to get the message out to people that probably hadn't actually heard it. Yeah. Anyway, I just wondered if you thought that was a good approach sometimes. Thank no, you. No, I, I, I think absolutely so. I think what's important about the um, kind of interpersonal and community dynamics uh, is like for the vast majority of people they are engaging in trans issues among among other issues but specifically trans issues that we're talking about now as abstractions right it's it's a it's not about what is happening but about what they are afraid could be happening or might be happening or could come to happen and so that kind of engagement with like this is not something abstract this is something that is real that there that is something that matters here and matters to people who are real human people you can but please don't touch um and the people that you would have to look in the face and be like i think you are a person right like those are all of the kinds of things that i think you know, we've we've really known, I think, since what Gordon Alport's uh, contact hypothesis was first published in like 1954, right? That type of uh, direct interpersonal contact, but also a kind of parasocial mediated uh, contact has significant impacts on prejudice reduction uh, and other things like that. We also know that humans are social animals and as much as we trust media we trust immediate sensory experience more and so we actually do have a preference for believing things that are told to us by people in real life uh and so like that for better and worse and it's often worse uh does have a, a significant impact uh that said i while i i did kind of have this focus on i do think much of this change making needs to be rooted in the community this the information system is a system right and there are many entry points many points of flow we can't just say okay we're going to focus here and control this because those doorways are still open to everything else it is unfortunate that we operate in a very resource intensive communication system uh which is very much what my first book is about uh that like you it actually does require kind of touching all of them at the same time because if you are only focused in one or even on two areas that last one is going to make sure it's like being on a sand build uh, being on the sand making a sand castle like that wave's coming it's great that you picked this spot in the sand it's lovely but unless you like put up a wall block in that water like it's all for naught and I think that that's very much the way that our hyper network media system works where we can't only have community uh, rooted change because if the only people you're hearing it from are in the community and everything else that you're receiving uh, from the state and, and the wider media system is at odds with it, like at a certain point, you, either the ambiguity is still increasing because you're like, I don't know what to do, that like, every domain is telling me something different, or it's just, you know, the, the local voice will be drowned out by the much louder, much more profitable, uh, much more Australian, <laughs> typically, media system uh, that is spreading different messages. That's not an attack on the country of Australia for anyone watching. That is just an attack on one specific man and his recently named male successor. Um, just in the interest of time, I know we are slightly running over. I'm going to take a final question from online because um, it kind of brings it back slightly to our local context. So in terms of having discussions at the level of a community, say, for example, the University of Edinburgh, this is my intonation, not the, yeah, yeah. Of the question. <laughs> um, what are your ideas, perhaps, um, for de-escalating conflict enough for there to be a discussion in the first place, rather than just existing in groups where you're preaching to the choir? That is a great question. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I wish I had an answer. Uh, I do think there are probably people here who deal with like uh, hostage negotiation situations or international peace treaty negotiations or something else who might be better equipped uh, to provide an answer than I am. Um, I, I do think that that is something that is, does not happen at a personal level, right? There is not a, this is what I can do as an individual entering an interaction to de-escalate that situation. I'm sure there are particularly adept people who can, but I think the broader issue is structural. What are the structure of these conversations? What are the communal standards that we have around what exchange of ideas has? I, I was uh, speaking about this with Gina before, we spoke one of the issues about, for example, the debates on academic freedom and things like that is that we get wrapped up in this idea of this like kind of individualized focus on like what someone is permitted to or ought be permitted to say and less a focus on what are collective communal standards, right? Uh, academically, that is often less going to be focused on the moral and the cultural the way it might be in just a general community of people. But for academics, it also has to do with like, what are the collective and communal standards for rigorous academic thought? Universities are not just platforms for speech, we are platforms for scholarship. And so scholarly standards are expected to be abided in those conversations that we hold. And it is important that universities don't, and this is something that happens in the US very frequently, where we're like, we'll bring this person to be a speaker because they're saying something everything everyone's talking about it's like with, with no necessary regard for what it is is being spoken about or how it's being spoken about or how it's being received and particularly like you have world-class thinkers typically on any given topic when you're at a, a world-leading institution so why are we bringing in somebody with no particular expertise or credential beyond the fact that they have a megaphone uh, and so i think that uh, whether it's at the university or elsewhere, the tone of conversation, the nature of conversation is not something that the individual participants in that conversation are responsible for. Though if you're one of the people with the worst tone, you're you're responsible for what you're doing. But structurally, the the convening spaces are are where that responsibility lies. And I do think that it is very easy, uh, clearly in the UK as well, but especially ideologically in America, for institutions and community spaces to throw their hands up and be like freedom because that's a very easy answer because it doesn't require you to do the work of community building and space making and uh and collective facilitation what a great point to end on and <laughs> um, thank you very much no And thank you for the to the staff pride network for organizing this really brilliant. And thank you to Sophia and also to Sophia um, and to UCU as well for their ongoing solidarity in this work. Uh, it was also acknowledged in comments in the online space as well from people elsewhere. So thank you for that too. And thank you to everyone for being here. Um, great. Thank you.